The cingulate cortex is compelling because it has both cognitive and motor functions. It's, reward in, it's involved in reward-based motor planning, reward expectancy, pain perception, error detection, and a bunch of other things that you don't even want to get me started on describing. <laughs> Basically does everything. My colleague Greg and I have published a paper on it uh, in German that will come out later this year called the cingulate cortex is everything. Or maybe notch signaling does everything. Okay, so let me uh, just, we, we do neural recordings in our lab. I'll just describe how we actually do our experiments. Our exper we uh, record with silicon substrate electrodes uh, where you use printed circuit technology, the same kind of technology that generates the chips in your cell phones and computer, but it's just slightly modified so that you have exposed electrode sites with uh, embedded traces running up the shank. And we buy these probes from uh, one of uh, Dell's competitors in China, Neural Next Step Technologies. It's much cheaper. Uh, so, you have electrode, you have brain. What kind of signals can you record? If you're an amateur neuroscientist and you want to do electrophysiology, one of the first things you can do is record an electroencephalogram, which is where you put an electrode on the scalp of the head and you can record gross uh, brain states. I can, if I put an electrode on your head and ground it properly, I can tell whether you're drowsy, whether you're asleep, whether you're alert, whether you're awake, things of that nature. If I want a higher resolution, higher signal noise ratio version of that, I can do an ECOG, where I put an electrode above or below the Jira matter. But with Daryl's electrodes, uh, we record LFPs and extracellular unit activity. Extracellular unit activity is spikes, action potentials. We're not doing intracellular unit recordings, but we can still, if we're lucky, isolate single units. And we can also record local field potentials. Does anybody know what local field potentials are? And where did you learn that? Uh, from uh, nowhere, actually. Yeah, what local field potentials are is, a, in my mind, a very controversial issue. People assume that it's excitatory postsynaptic potentials that's based on one paper in the early 80s. But we'll just leave it at that. And it was a modeling paper that no one ever reads. It's about 30 pages, very hard to read. It takes you a week. All right, so uh, uh, we use rats in our, in our experiments. Here's our typical setup. You know, the, the, it's not wireless. Um, it's a, you can see they're tethered to a commentator and the output cables go to the various hardware. Here's a close-up. Though we're implanting a rat, you know, and it, it looks kind of gross, you can see that he looks very ratty, he's curious, he, his behavior appears relatively normal. So we put this electrode in the brain. Here's a schematic of the silicon ribbon cable going into a craniotomy. Here's another schematic of the electrode penetrating the motor cortex. This in yellow is an isolated single unit. And then these are a series of local field potentials during oscillatory periods. <coughs> what does this actually look like in real time? If you implant an electrode in a rat and you immediately plug them into your recording hardware, this, that sound is the sound of the spiking activity. And so you can see these little ticks are spikes and the uh, lower traces are local field potentials. Oops. All right, so let me dive into the experiments finally. So I implanted a series of 27 rats, though seven were ultimately used for the data analysis for various reasons. I implanted the cingulate cortex of the rat. You can see the implantation sites. Colin Stetzner, uh, in, a in a triumph of histology, was able to keep the probe intact in C2. You can see it penetrating the cingulate cortex. And there's more traditional nissel stains. We can see the four electrode tracks penetrating the cingulate cortex. So how did I actually determine whether or not the cingulate cortex could be an alternative site? I, uh, I would isolate a single unit or a multi-neuron cluster. I would record, I would have about 8 to 12 second intertrial interval, a two second baseline where I would record the baseline activity of the cingulate cortex, then a tone would be delivered, and then the rat had the next five seconds with which to increase or decrease the neural discharge rate of the cingulate cortex in order to receive a food pellet. I'm only going to have one equation in this talk. I think you all can understand it. Can someone tell me what this equation is? Straight line? You've all passed junior high. Um, so Y is the threshold for reward. X is the baseline firing rate standard deviation. B is the baseline firing rate. And M is the coefficient I set. So the rat effectively has to modulate its singular cortex activity some number of baselines away from its mean firing rate. What does this actually look like? 
So here you can see isolated single units before training and after training. You can see indeed that the rat can learn to increase or decrease the uh, firing rate of its cingulate cortex in order to be rewarded. And what does this look like in uh, reality? Um, this rat was trained to decrease its firing rate. You'll hear a tone and you'll notice a decrease in neural discharge. So you heard that tone and then you heard the decrease. Let me increase the master volume on here. So out of seven rats, I isolated 34 single units and multi-neuron clusters, and 23 of those were trainable. That's 68%. Assuming a binomial probability model, that means if after this talk, you go to your lab, you want to train a cingulate cortex, you implant a random cell, you hold on to a random cell, that cell has a 50 to 80% chance of being trainable. So it argues that perhaps the cingulate cortex could be a compelling alternative site for a neuroprosthetic. This was my pride and joy. This experiment took two years. <sighs> and no one cared. Um, uh, so since the cingulate cortex is also involved in stimulus reward associations, you could argue that the increases and decreases in neural discharge rate I saw were an effect of Pavlovian conditioning. You set up a contingency between tone and reward. Perhaps the cingulate cortex is merely encoding that contingency and not actually the, the rat is not using, it's not operant conditioning. It's not voluntary control of behavior. So what I had to do was change the rules. So I'd hold on to a single cell, train it to increase its firing rate, then change the rules such that the, the, the same neural had to decrease its firing rate, then change the rules that it had to increase its firing rate. So such flexible responses argues that it's not Pavlovian learning. Um, it took two years, but the problem is I have to hold on to a single cell. You can see here like uh, 16 days, 7 days. Anyone who does electrophysiology knows this is hard and very, very controversial. I just use autocorrelogram auto shape and waveform shape to determine whether or not it was the same neuron over time. All right, no one's going to argue with me on that. Okay. And there's the other two cells. So four out of six cells could do this. Okay, some of you familiar with this field of neuroprosthetics might say, Tim, this study was trite. Many other groups have shown that many other areas of the cortex can be trainable. And I would respond, well, this experiment was designed in 2003. And over the past four or five years, other groups have demonstrated the parietal cortex, the somatosensory and auditory cortex, dorsal premotor. But at the time I designed this study, there was some kind of ancient studies in the visual cortex and striatum, visual cortex actually done by Brian Finks uh, in his early days, and then uh, motor cortex. So really, at the time, there was, I, it was an interesting question to ask. But now, with the advent of fMRI, fMRI imaging and biofeedback, investigators are now starting to systematically map which areas of the brain can be useful as output signals. Okay, let's go on to the next experiment. So like I said, you can record local field potentials in addition to spiking activity um, when you use an electrode. So there's been an idea in the field of perhaps you could use both LFPs and spikes for a maximal, reliable, robust control signal. So, what I wanted to do is actually analyze the covariation of LFPs and spikes in a motor learning and neuroprosthetic task to see how truly independent these uh, signals are. Concurrent with the invasive uh, motor unit recordings in monkeys and humans, uh, there's also been another effort by Jonathan Wolpa and a group in Germany to train humans to modulate their EEG activity. This is a hard task. It's a motor learning task. It takes about three months to learn due to the low signal noise ratio of the EEG. But humans can learn to do it. And here's a movie of what it looks like. So the human is controlling the small square and, and he's trying to target the large square. And also, Phil Kennedy yet again raises his head, years ahead of everybody else. In 2004, he trained a locked-in patient to modulate the amplitude of an LFP recorded with his electrodes. And so when the amplitude of the LFP crossed the threshold, it controlled a switch. 